Sounds good. Yeah, I am prepared. Okay. Your problem is going to be stopping me talking, probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. That's good. I think we're live now. Okay. 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 Mr. Clark, hello. How are you doing? I'm very good, and it's very good to meet you this afternoon, Mr. Perry. Morning here, buddy. Morning. Yeah, well, <laughs> morning, afternoon, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I met Rob. Well, I haven't met Rob, but uh, we've uh, vicariously met over the Internet via the Modelers Guild, and you've been sharing some fantastic photos that uh, – you know, the average photo shows an entire scene that's like unedited, but you kind of take the best parts of a photo and just kind of slice it out. And that really makes for some unique perspectives. It, it, I, I fell in love with it. Some people might call it cheating. Um, but yeah, when you zoom in on something like that, uh, provided it looks okay, you, you get a sense of realism. I, th I think you imagine what's around the picture. Yeah. Uh, and that kind of helps it. Yeah, yeah. And that perspective looking up. Well, watching those, Lord, looking at those pictures, you know, I just really wanted to talk to you and do a meet the modeler interview. So uh, thanks for coming on and uh, taking a chance with me. <laughs> I appreciate you asking me along, Ron. Thank you. So, so uh, I hear from the accent, you're from another country. Uh, how did you get into the hobby? And why is it Western model rail or Western railroads that you model? <laughs> Very good question. Um, I'm old enough to remember steam, uh, mainline steam. When we used to take our vacations, uh, we were pulled by mainline steam engines. In the UK, mainline steam went a lot later than the US. Uh, and obviously, as a, as a child, I had um, the, the obligatory train set. So that was a formative thing. Um, I think young, young children, young boys are very, very much influenced by steam engines. So that stuck with me. But then it went away and I started playing with a toy called Meccano. I don't know if you've got that in the US. It's, it's, a, it's a British thing. Yeah, um, yeah. No. It's a metal construction toy. Uh, you can make anything out of it. Uh, and it was very popular from the 1930s to the 1970s, which was when I was a kid. So I played with Meccano, didn't much, do much with... Um, with trains. Uh, and I got the Meccano magazine. And in August 1969, and hopefully you can see this, yeah, this thing turned up. Uh, so this, this guy, Graham Highland, had built a Meccano model. And this is about four feet long of a, of a Union Pacific uh, 412 II. Uh, and that quite impressed me. I actually wrote to this guy. This is before the internet when you used pen and paper. <laughs> uh, we communicated a little. But, of course, that got me looking at American locomotives. Um, struck your fire. <laughs> yeah, and that's what it should look like. Uh, and this just hugely impressed me um, because uh, steam engines in the UK, uh, are everything's covered over. They're, they're kind of streamlined. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. But an American steam locomotive, I think very sensibly, hangs everything on the outside. But it, yeah. it, looks, it just looks hugely impressive. And once I saw this picture, um, I just started reading up about American railroads and American steam superpower in the 20s. And it, it just grew from that. that, that uh, and that's why I particularly like American railroads and ended up modeling railroads. You but know, I, that picture really has all the bells and whistles right up front, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's hugely, uh, hugely impressive. Yeah. Um, and that's what did it for me. But I, around about 15 years old, I, I mean, I, I, did, I did try to do some American railroads, but it's expensive and I wasn't very experienced. Yeah. I bought, a, bought a, um, one of those roundhouse, MDC roundhouse 060 kits, probably the worst thing I could have done. <laughs> it was quite difficult to build, and I wasn't that skilled, and I ended up throwing it out. Anyway, along came girls and music uh, and life, mm -hmm. and I did nothing until I was probably about 55. Oh, it's wow. about five or six years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's the usual demographic. You know, you, you get older, 
and you've got more time and you've got more money and you start looking for things to do. And I went back to railroads and they were American because of what I just told you. Mm -hmm. And I started building and I built a chainsaw railroad, just a small four foot long thing. Mm -hmm. And then having got rid of that, I then moved on to the, the Cornhill and Atherton that, that you see now, which is about half finished. It's HO scale, right? It's HO scale indeed. Um, probably one of the most popular ones. I can't see N anymore. My eyes have gone. Uh, and O's, I O's just way too expensive. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. It's a good compromise. Um, yeah. The larger the scale, the less you have to model, really. Indeed you do. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you've been working on this layout for five or six years or? Uh, no. Um, I got back into the hobby about five, six years ago. Mm -hmm. This has been built for about, um, about three, three and a half years. Oh, wow. Uh, it's a, it's a two decks, not big, 11 by eight. Um, that's a top deck. Mm -hmm. It's, it's kind of a point to point. So we start in Atherton, run through past Besmar mining, past Mortimer into the helix, down the helix. Oh, wow. Yep. And then we come, which has a, uh, trestle on it then out of the helix through Cornhill to Glanton. And then we have two, uh, tracks going down to a, a lower level staging yard. Hmm. Uh, so there's a lot there and only the top deck is, is in existence so far. Um, it's, if I show you this view, this is looking into the room through the entrance door. Oh, I see. This is, this is our top deck here, uh, with the helix just to the right of the picture. Mm -hmm. And the lining valances above. This is probably about ooh, two and a half years ago. Um, okay. This this top deck is is almost complete now. Mm -hmm. And the the other decks aren't in, but the helix is all the way down. Correct. If if okay. you drive down the helix, you end up on the floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's deliberate. The the it's a slow ride down instead of the fast ride. <laughs> yes, it's a slow ride followed by a fast ride. <laughs> yeah. The whole thing's been built top down, though. That that that's why I've done it that way. Um, I built all of the the lighting valances first before the railroad, then the top deck, then the helix, and the, the bottom deck will be built next. But it means you don't have a bottom deck in your way while you're working on the top deck. And because I'm not operating it yet, the operation will come when it's completed. Um, I'm just concentrating on building the, the scenery, if you like, all the tracks in, and I'm doing the scenery now. Oh, wow. That's a remarkable way of doing that. Uh, I have to have a bit of faith in myself. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully, it'll run okay. <laughs> hey, no, no, I mean starting the top and going down. Like, you'd think that starting down and then going up would make sense, but you could build all that stuff separately and just plop it in after, right? Is that how yeah. you're going to do it? It was it was all very deliberate because what I thought was that, if, as you can see, this this uh, the lighting valance is is quite complex, mm -hmm. and I thought there was a great risk of damaging um, an already built railroad by trying to install all of this afterwards. Oh, I see. Yeah. So um, I used a thing called Extract CAD, um, yeah. design yeah. free design software. Yeah. Which I'm great uh, enthusiast of. Awesome. So I was able to, to plan down to the last centimeter pretty much everything, the valances, the decks, and all the rest of it. So I was able to, to build this valance with confidence, knowing that it would match the railroad as I came down. Hmm. So that's the idea, top down. Very nice. Nice mess. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. The Extract Cat is free, and we'll put a link in the video. Uh, it's brilliant. brilliant. Quite a steep learning curve, um, I've got to say. Um, but it's well worth the effort. Is that a case of Extract CAD or uh, 3D CAD type programs? It's probably a, uh, a problem with all, all of them. But, yeah. but I must say that, that Extract, yeah. I, I found it was kind of unintuitive. Um, a, a lot of software, good software, you, you, you don't have to read the book. You know, you can just go on and click and pretty pretty quickly you work out what to do i see but, but with extract i found i did have to read up on it some things weren't obvious oh, once, I you, see. once you know how to do it it's fine but it's 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 a, like i say it's a steep learning well it's not steep it's kind of reverse steep it's really hard to get started yeah and then yeah. it gets easier and easier really quickly yeah also known as starting <laughs> over a bunch of times until you figure it out yeah <laughs> 
<laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. New file. <laughs> You are from England, and you shared with me a photo just before we started the video. I did. Um, and I've been watching yeah. a lot of documentaries from the United Kingdom, and the Empire, and stuff like this. Where are you from? Uh, well, I'm from the northeast of England, um, so two-thirds of the way up the eastern coast. Yeah. Uh, this picture, hopefully you can see now, is uh, zooming in on, on the River Tyne. Uh, I live in Newcastle upon Tyne. Well, that's yeah. the nearest city. Uh, it's been there an awful long time, but it's it's a it was an industrial area, so coal mining, shipbuilding, um, and they've pretty much gone now. Uh, they, they've been dead for many years, mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of a lot of railway uh, history as well, um, because obviously moving coal and, and having ships coming in and out, you, you need a lot of transport. Yeah, there's a heritage railway close to you, is there not? Absolutely. There's a yeah. I live um, just where I'm moving the cursor now, kind of on the top left. Yeah. Uh, and the heritage railway runs down here, and um, it's uh -huh. steam, and it's on my bucket list to drive that steam locomotive but first of all i have to volunteer for the place first and do a bit of um do a bit of boiler cleaning i think yeah, <laughs> so yeah you gotta start cleaning gotta the start dishes somewhere. before you get to be the cook you do yeah. yeah yeah but i live in north shields and north shields and south shields are both fishing towns and they both go back to sort of 13th century uh um and this the rest they are still fishing towns but that's oh, where wow. i'm from so it's a medieval feel. So it, it is, yeah. It's, awesome. Uh, yeah, they are medieval towns. Yeah, yeah. So it <laughs> it is a real large. Okay, so it's probably not common at all for people to model outside of your region. I think you're right. Um, I, I I don't think many UK modelers uh, model US prototype. I mean, they are there, yeah. Well, certainly. Yeah. Um, but there aren't many. I'm not particularly aware of any in my area. Uh, in your, in, in my in my my part of the town, my part of the the the, uh, the UK. But like I said to you before this, I'm a bit of a lone wolf anyway. Yeah, it's a weakness. <laughs> no, I think it's a <laughs> it's a tool. Uh, so, well, in your opinion, what are the differences other than the equipment? I have a, a suspicion of what you're going to say, but what are the differences between uh, UK and North American scenery, I guess I'm saying. The American scenery is, is a lot, in general, a lot grander. Um, although that, that's not a big pull for me because I, um, I, because I model short line, mm. uh, it's, it's not big mountains. Um, but there's the scenery, um, in the UK, uh, railway lines are kind of segregated from the scenery. Oh. You know, they, 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 there are fences everywhere. Yeah, um, like hedgerows. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So um, in, in American railroads, everything's much more open. I, I feel that American railroads are more part of the community and the landscape, whereas British railways kind of run through it. <laughs> so uh, that's part of it. And like I said before, I think the equipment is more attractive. Mm. It's, and it's bigger. <laughs> Because yeah. it's, it's, it's better. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The muscle, muscle car version of the railroad. Yeah. Yeah. I like muscle cars too. I was, I was very unusually in about, in about 1964, I think as a, as a nine year old or 10 year old, I was, I was interested in American muscle cars. Used to try and get a uh, hot rod magazine. Yeah. <laughs> Still like muscle cars. <laughs> so you're saying you're a lone wolf. I guess that means there's no clubs or, or you've, a, there's no clubs near you. None that I'm aware of, um, but like I said, being a lone wolf, I haven't looked too hard. Mm. But th there aren't, th th there won't be any U.S. Yeah, not, yeah, yeah. Not that exactly. would be a negotiation, I believe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and probably, to be honest, probably not a, a friendly one either. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> the, the thing is, that with the with the power of the internet, you know, like like we're doing this now, um, the world's a smaller place. You got that it's, right. It's a, it's a lot easier to uh, communicate with, with like-minded people. Um, mm -hmm. And to be honest, to, to, to do any kind of a good job, I think, with a, with a U.S. railroad, you need to talk to U.S. people. Uh, I see, yes. You're going to get it wrong. <laughs> yeah, you, know, you get photographs from their backyard, which is awesome. 
kind of thing. Yeah, and and I can't do that. I have to yeah. do everything by proxy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hobby shops. Same as same as clubs. Very thin. Oh, wow. Um, we do, or we had three in the area, which is, which is pretty good actually. Um, one of them has just gone about three weeks ago, and the other two uh, are. Well, one of them is more um, radio control aircraft, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and the other one is is purely a UK outline. Obviously, for general supplies, they're okay, um, but yeah, most yeah. of the stuff I have to get, um, I have to buy online. Mm -hmm. just, like scenery supplies you can deal with, but uh, everything else you have to outsource. Pretty much, pretty much, uh, yeah. So the thing about your, uh, your when we first met is your photographs are so well done. Did you start with photography or did you get into photography because of your modeling? The second one. Um, uh, I didn't know anything about photography. Uh, or very little other than taking holiday snaps uh, until uh, I started the railroading. And it was purely a, a tool, really, to, to just take some pictures I could, so I could share them in forums um, and critique things. It's, it's, photography is a great way of, of freezing what you've done and looking at it really hard and, and spotting things that are wrong. And as soon as I started taking photographs, I realized that um, I wasn't very good. <laughs> so... so um, I, I started, <laughs> I started to, to, to find out how to, to do photography <laughs> properly so that I could do justice to what I was trying to do. So, so the photography came second, very much so. Um, and it remains a, a secondary hobby. It's, it's, it's a means to an end. Mm, mm. It's kind of like extract CAD. When you first start, it's really, really, really hard. <laughs> Absolutely. An, an extract CAD was another tool. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, um, I generally only learn things or find out about things if I have a need to. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Invention is the mother of necessity, or necessity is the mother of invention. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, the railroading is, is, the, uh, is the end game. Um, and if I have to learn other things, other technologies on the way, then, then I'll do that. It actually is kind of funny how uh, natural it is to get into photography today I don't know if this was the way it was back in the 70s, but, you know, today photography really is a tool that you're using to find that unpainted detailed part or, you know, that, that piece of plaster that's showing out stark white. Like, if you can see it in a photo, you can go back and fix it. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And, I, and I think um, the digital age has made a big difference. Um, when you had to take the photograph and go get it developed, nah. <laughs> It's, you remember, uh, well, in, in North America, you have to drive up to this little booth in the middle of a parking lot. And it really was a booth. It was like maybe four feet wide by six to eight feet long. And it was this person sat in the booth all day long in the middle of a parking lot of like where a Walmart would be today. Yeah. And people would drive up and drop their film off there. Yeah. <laughs> In in the UK, the only place that you could get films developed uh, were, were um, chemist shops, so yeah. where they sell dr drug stores, drug stores oh. basically, yeah. And drug stores would have would have um, developing equipment. I don't, don't ask me why, but that's they where you went. They cornered the market. They had the monopoly. <laughs> yep, somebody did. They say we can do this. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. But the digital age age is uh, tremendous, absolutely tremendous. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Really has changed modeling for the better. I think. It has. Yep. For the most part. Yep. <laughs> what kind of equipment do you use for the scenes? Like, uh, you're not just using photographs. Like, when I look at your photographs, they're as focused uh, at the first blade of grass to the last blade of grass in the scene, and that's not yeah. done naturally. Correct. Um, I do use a good old snap camera. Um, a Lumix, and and that's fine for taking quick pictures. It, it to be honest, that'll that'll take a better picture than a a single end reflex. Yeah. If you're in a hurry. Yeah. Um, but beyond that, that, that is a a normal point and click camera with a uh, yeah. yeah normal yeah. point. It's yeah. a pretty good one, um, but you don't have much control over it. Uh, mm -hmm. It'll take a good photograph within limits. Um, mm -hmm. 
but it's, got after... a nice, it's got a nice wide aperture to it so that it's yeah. uh, as focused as it can be for any scene within like a certain range. Yeah, yeah. There's yeah. a lot of compromise going on with that. But mm -hmm. once I kind of outgrew that, then I and went back to the pictures. Um, I got myself one of these uh, Nikon D5100. Oh, I've got uh, a 3200. Uh, they're a very good camera. Um, mm -hmm. I could have bought anything. Uh, I think I bought this because I saw in some other forums that, that guys were using them for model railroads. And also, um, it had been around for a few years. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I never buy bleeding edge when it comes to technology. I like to buy something that's a few years old, mm -hmm. cheaper, more reliable. Yeah. Uh, and, and I love it. Uh, and it does everything that I want it to do. Uh, it's let's say that it's it's better than me, <laughs> so, <laughs> so so I'm very happy with it. Yeah, yeah. But going back to your other point about um, everything being in focus, uh, you can you can stop the these cameras down quite quite well and, and get pretty good depth of field, but you do hit limits. Uh, and I came across um, focus stacking. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I'd seen it done, and I, I was very impressed with it. So yeah. I got myself couple of bits of software um and focus stacking is as opposed to a point and shoot camera uh you have you take your field of range down to a very small range so that it only picks the front of the photo or the back of the photo and puts that into focus and the photo stacking takes all those focused parts of the images and stack as, stacks those together Absolutely. Um, yeah. you, you actually, you take a number of photographs. Uh, yeah. Typically, I take about 15, mm -hmm. 10, 10 to 15, as you say, from, from the, the nearest point to the farthest point. And the focus mm -hmm. stacking software very cleverly uh, assembles them all, works out all the bits that, 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 that aren't quite right, and, and comes mm -hmm. up with this, this great picture. Mm -hmm. um, so now, what I did... now, your camera does that automatically. Doesn't it, does it do bracketing? Mm -hmm. Uh, it does bracketing, but it doesn't. It doesn't do um, stacking automatically, which yeah. actually brings us on to the, the next picture. This one, sure. I got this piece of free software, Digicam Control. Before you um, move on, my point about that was: is my thirty two hundred doesn't have bracketing, and I think that's the difference between ours. Shucks. Um. But you could probably still use yours. I mean, the, the oh, bracketing, yeah. I, the I bracketing on this one is, is only, it only takes three photos bracketed. Oh, I'm not I sure see. about the 3200, probably none. No, no, it doesn't. The I three, have to do it manually. Yeah, three isn't enough. And, and it's the same with this one. You do have to manually focus. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the problem with the focus stacking because if you take multiple photographs, you, you need to have a smooth change between mm -hmm. each. Uh, each focus point, uh, mm -hmm. and it's difficult to do it manually, which is why I got this bit of software, which uh, is hugely powerful. But you, you hook your camera up to it with a, um, a mini USB cable, mm -hmm. plug it in, and then you can completely control the camera from the software, see the picture on the screen. Uh, but more importantly, um, you can you can take multiple photographs. Um, I'm, we'll not go into this too much now. It's not a it's not but, a focus stacking tutorial. But sorry, sorry. Uh, we talk about focus stacking a fair bit on my channel, and uh, we uh, we have a sponsor, uh, Helicon Focus, which is yep. a pay for program. Yep. And I have a question: uh, Will this combine? Uh, will this do? Uh, you said your bracketing only takes three photos. Will this take more photos than that in the bracketing? Yes. Uh, okay, good. Because I was going to say Helicon does that too. Yeah. It'll take it'll take thousands if you want to. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you want to. Yeah. Uh, so that that means that the software is actually controlling your camera to change the manual focus to move that focal point a couple yeah. of inches out yeah. until it goes from the front of the scene to the back of the scene, and then it stacks them together. Absolutely. Well, yeah. Uh, actually, the, this this piece of software. Um, I don't use this to do the stacking. Oh. I use another piece of software uh, called... So this is camera Line control. ZM. I'm only using uh, this one for camera control. Yeah. I, I have a feeling that buried in this software, there is some stacking stuff, but I've never 
I've never tried to use it. I, I used the combined ZM, which is like free stacking software first. And then I came across Digicam Control and, and I just used the two. But mm -hmm. Helicon Focus does it all in one package. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's and it probably does it better. Well, and, I'm, and I'm sure it does it a lot better than this. <laughs> no, well, I'm not going to send anybody to pay for something if it can be used elsewhere. But it's got a, a bunch of features, you're right. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, you, oh, very briefly, what you do is you, you can probably see there's a green green square here. Mm -hmm. you, you, you click the square on, the, on a, a foreground part, zoom in, use these uh, control buttons here to zoom and focus it, get it in focus, oh. lock it, lock it, and then just look at the back of the, the picture, the farthest point, zoom into that, lock it, and then tell it how many pictures you want to take between the, the nearest and the farthest point, 5, 10, 5,000, whatever. And then you just go away and leave it, and it just takes the pictures. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, that's interesting. That does that much differently. Yeah. To be honest, I've, I haven't used Helicon, so I, I don't really know what the differences are, but I think that they, they, they do the same thing, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just It's just interface. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, when you've got your 10, 15, or 15,000 photographs, yeah. um, you put them through, or I put them through this thing, Combine mm -hmm. ZM, very old piece of software. Yeah. And again, I'll not go into detail, but you just load up your photographs, submit them to um, uh, a macro command. It's, it's one command to load, one command to process, uh, and then it produces a combined image for you. Mm -hmm. And this is an example here, not a particularly deep one. Mm -hmm. The only peculiarity is you, you, the software creates this strange border that you have mm -hmm. to clip off. Yeah. But it works. It's free and it works. Oh, I see. Now, in uh, Helicon, they have different styles of uh, focus, focal compression, like pyramids and different things. And I think that fixes it in Helicon Focus. So probably does. Yeah. You might have a setting that says uh, focus style pyramids. I, I'll look into it later for you. Yeah. Anyways. Helicon's got to be better than this, but it's good enough for me. Um, yeah. Is that the use of a mirror in the background there behind that truck? No, this is um, this is just uh, a road in the backdrop, um, and it's they're just kind of blended. That's a picture, though. That's this is a yeah, that's two D, completely two okay. D. Cool. The back there. Yeah, that's very well blended. Thank you. Yeah, I like how the the road just behind the bumper of the truck kind of looks like it's going up a bit. That's dirt on the ground there, right? Yeah, uh, actually, you're right. What, what there is here, and, and I got this from um, copying a guy called Tom Johnson. Um, the road uh, is flat. Then at the back, the, the, the rear inch, inch and a half, goes up and then curls over at the back. Uh, and that hides, softens the join between the, the 3D road and the 2D backdrop. Yeah. That, the, the hard part is getting the colors the same. This This shot isn't actually doing it full justice, but it, getting these colored the same is, is really tricky. No, this, but this is a great example of how a photo can can help you nudge a scene along to perfection. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the photography is very it's a very harsh mistress. <laughs> no, you there's a lot behind. of things in this scene that I really like. Uh, the road is curving off to the right. The, the structure, uh, the way... It, you can't see where the back is. There's no 90 degree back anywhere in the scene, and I love it. Thanks for that. We'll we'll come back to that actually because that that's been very deliberately done, um, so that you've got these black spots like behind mm -hmm. this building depth. That there's only there's only half an inch there, but but you create a black spot. Does that ever um, scream at you? Something. And, and what your is it? your imagine exactly? Your imagination <laughs> fills in the hole and and says, "Oh, that's going somewhere." It isn't, yeah. but yeah. you get the illusion that it does. You know, you might not be into art or really consider art when you get into this hobby, but if you really sit there and ponder things on your layout, you'll get to that artistic's point of view no matter what. Absolutely. Uh, a side effect of, of uh, the modeling is that I now look at trees and scenery, uh, and, and I've started to love trees just for their natural beauty because you, you start – well, you look at the world in a different way. Yeah. Look at the variation in the photo, like uh, where the chimney is on the structure. That tree has just a subtle change in the color in it, and it's it's 
it kind of brings out the 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 tree right beside the road on the right side of the building it's kind of a standard green you know and and all those variations between them all come together into a mosaic it's beautiful i i love the i love this whole scene like this is what i'm talking about rob this is why we're talking today these photographs really make you fall in love with the scene it's awesome uh it, yeah it's it's kind of what what you're seeing is 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 the thinking backwards um We'll talk about this later when, when I think we're going to talk about how, how you set up scenes, but you have scenes within scenes within scenes. Yeah. Um, and this this is kind of zooming into one of the lower levels. You, you start off with a big picture and then you move, you, you, you come into these very small scenes and you can detail them and then you zoom back out again. Uh, uh, and that, that's, I think, why it works so well. Uh huh. Uh, you, you... So this scene obviously started with the double main line, but uh, uh, did you plop the structure down and work around it, or did you have a plan for this beforehand? Um, bit of both. Uh, it, probably less of a plan. Um, what I, the way I do this is, is I, I get pieces of uh, foam, carve them roughly to shape. I'll get, uh, if, if a building's already built like this one was, I'll use the building or I'll make cardboard mock-ups mm -hmm. and then just put them down on, on the, the raw uh, baseboard with a track mm -hmm. and then just move them around. Mm -hmm. You and, really have to have a vision in your mind to make that work. That's awesome. Uh, well, it, I don't, usually I don't have a vision. It's, um, it's a case of put things down almost randomly look at them and and does it feel right or does it not move things around a bit uh, and you kind of feel your way to, you allow the scene to inspire you in a way yeah it, it's kind of a feedback loop um start with a, a rough idea and and then let it develop and, and sometimes it can take days i might set it up and go away walk you away know, you know i pity those who don't experience this in their hobby <laughs> <laughs> it's well it, it's to be savored uh, it takes time, but you know that's we've got plenty of time. It's the I think beauty the, and the magic. The, the, the worst thing in the world, I think, is is, is to rush at this. You know, say, so "Got to get it finished. Got to get it finished." No, yeah, yeah. yeah. Take, take time, enjoy it. Yeah. Enjoy it. The NMRA convention is the root of all evil. Don't <laughs> let the NMRA convention come to your area and make you start your finishing your layout. Yeah. <laughs> so enjoy it. Yeah. So okay. So you uh okay let's just stick with the scene for a second is this a scratch built structure or is this a structure from an american company it's a campbell structure um it i think it started I, I have changed it a little it started off as a i think a uh, a newspaper office it was a um flat-fronted building uh, and i just converted it into this small engineering office but this, it hasn't been changed much uh just just made it a took off the uh, the flat front and and lowered it as well but it's a pretty basic Campbell structure now I got a question and don't don't try to assume my question my answer or why I'm asking it why isn't there any uh, weathering like uh, I'm not talking about peeling paint but you know uh, like rusting or stuff like that is that that you don't aren't you don't model you don't what am I trying to say here is it that you uh, don't weather your models or that you just... I, I do weather them. Um, the, I, I can see it's, it's subtly, light. Uh, subtly on the roof. I'm expecting to see a little bit of rust or stuff like that, though. It, you do weather them? I do. Um, Maybe that's what makes this model there, look there, so good. There's a, I don't know how, if you can, how well you can see this, but um, there's a small amount of weathering from where the stack is. Yeah, so I can see it coming, coming down uh, from the, yeah. the ridge. All of these tiles are very slightly weathered. Oh, I can see on the, the bottom edge. Yeah. Um, okay. It's probably the angle of the shot. Uh, I, I'm not criticizing it. No, no, no. I, I'm not I, criticizing. I'm just uh, like, I'm looking at it. I'm like, you know, you look at these uh, George Selios, the, fi uh, the fine scale miniatures layout and stuff like that. Um, my mom just walked in the door. <laughs> <laughs> <I don't. laughs> but uh 
I was wondering who was looking over my shoulder. Um, but you look at these layouts and they're the people. The comments are is that they're over weathered. Yes, this is uh, very I agree. subtle. I and agree. This scene looks perfect. Yeah. Um, the the reasoning here is that uh, these people are looking after their properties. Uh, mm -hmm. the, okay, the, I can the, see weathering on the sign there. Now the, yeah, the, there's a little bit of dirt. You know that yeah. he isn't going to clean that sign every week, but there's a little bit of dirt. And the uh, truck. You can see there's there's some some grime around the wheels. So there is weathering here. There is weathering, it is, but it's very subtle. It it's fit. It fits the scene so well. Yeah. Even the dogs weathered. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. That's yeah. cool. But I, now, I agree with you. That there's a kind of a. Um, I'll use the term rust bucket, which which is a, is a bit emotive, but you, you can because some stuff does get very very rusty. But I think people tend to overdo it, uh, and it can, res it can there's a risk it becomes a caricature of reality. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is it's not unrealistic to have over weathered stuff, and it's not unrealistic to have something that's uh, aged gracefully like this you know yeah. who's had Absolutely. uh you know a handyman uh do the spring activities it, it you're right it depends on the on the on the, on the circumstance what well, one of the the mental things that i had to get over was was the fact that i'm modeling the 1930s and you think that's a hell of a long time ago but yeah. the reality is that back in 1930s a lot of this stuff would be new or yeah. maybe just four or five years old even 10 years old it's not going to be falling apart uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. So where we were talking about your photo, and I was uh, just noticing that the next question was the coloring of the scenery is impeccable. <laughs> That's a nice word. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you want me to do you want me to share again and pick up where we were? And we can just ease into it. Yeah, let's move on to another picture, though. Show us another yep, scene. And sure. we'll, let's let's just... pick it apart again. You know, let's just talk about things that you know people who don't build models would never be able to come up with. Okay. Like this, like I, I like to do things that are interesting. And this little troll event that's happening today, it's still ongoing. Oh. You know, it, I I just think to myself to really put the worth out for you know my interviews is i have to connect with the modeler in you and pull out the questions that no other talking head could ever come up with because they'd never even go there in their mind you know well you're doing a very good job i'm uh, i'm enjoying this very much yeah i i'm trying my best not to have all this stuff affect me, but you can tell. <laughs> I'm buzzing on the inside with like, oh, I'm tormented. <laughs> Just so you know where, where we can be going next, that, that's the picture we were looking at. I think the next question, as you say, is about uh, coloring of scenery. How do you do scenery? Um, and what's that? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'm zoomed out. Uh, so I was going to show this picture, which kind of, um, it goes through all of the construction techniques in one picture. Uh, and then now, this is really cool because that photo here, I'm going to share your screen, present your screen. Let's present your screen there. You're locked on you. So uh, because we were talking about George Selios earlier and he's got a scene that's much like this. No, no, maybe not uh, the, the lower line. Yeah, it's, but it's he big. has a floor to top of the bench scenery like this. this yes, awesome. it does. Yeah, uh, it probably makes it look a little bit more dramatic than it is because of the angle of the shot. But but it's a very deep scene. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that was going to be able to talk about the different techniques, and then in terms of coloring, um, just have a look at this, which I've got to say is, is a Woodland Scenics advert. <laughs> Sorry, mm -hmm. uh, and then a bit about um, general stuff. Okay. Trees and what have you. So that, that's the direction we can go in. Okay. So that's uh, uh, your helix in behind there. That's how, how you've hidden it. Exactly. Um, hiding a helix uh, was a challenge. 
I, I see a little half door underneath there. So that's a service entrance, I take it? Uh, th on the right here? Yeah. Yeah. That, this is the, the entrance room to the door, to the entrance entrance door to the room. Oh, uh, that's where the tip out is. Or, yeah. or is so it a duck is, under? It's a duck under, yeah. And there'll okay. be another um, fold-up section for the lower deck to be built here. Oh, I see. So that's going to be complicated. Yes. A bit more complicated. This originally was a lift-out section, um, but it, yeah. it, it made the scenery very difficult to join. So I just... I just gave up and made it permanent. So I, that is hard shell, though. Uh, yeah, it's um, on the left. You can see we've got uh, mesh, aluminum mesh, and that's fastened with hot glue. And then the next layer is where we've got plaster cloth applied. Um, skipping over to the right, the, the brown area here is sculptor mold, and this has had a an earth wash applied to it. A pigment. Yeah. Yeah, and then the other stuff is is um, plaster uh, castings. That that uh, tip out is possible to become a, a whatever you could you could make you could still cut that out as a as an ex carpenter. One of these days, you're going to take that on. I bet. Um, <laughs> I may well, I may well have to when I get a little bit older, and I can't do the duck anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because it, it is really easy to hide uh, these seams uh, after you get experienced. And the way you're using mirrors and stuff like that, you, you use a 45 kind of where the scenery kind of overlaps each other, like two pieces of paper laying yeah. on top of each other. Yeah. It'll be hidden, like a display. Yeah. I know what you mean. Yeah. 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 For the future. Yeah. Yeah. Fear not. <laughs> Let your ideas go all the way. Yeah, yeah. So the, I see the, so this, I see the line that is, uh, is that the second level line? And then uh, this, this one eight. here, do you mean? No, the one below it. Oh, this. Okay. Um, that is pretty close to the exit of the helix. The helix is, um, it's a herniated helix. So that the, the bottom level is pulled out. The bottom turn is pulled out. Oh, I see. So we, so we get the, um, the trestle here. I mean, this is all finished now. This is an older photograph. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, was, it was really just to try and get some, some visual feedback as the train goes through the helix because it, it's, it's boring. It disappears. Yeah, so it's gone. So we, yeah. we, we enter the top right here. This is coming off the, off the top deck into a tunnel. Yeah. One turn round. And then we come through this open section here, a cutaway section. So yeah. we get a bit of feedback there. It disappears for about three turns. And then we see it again on the, um, on the trestle. And then it, you can't see it around the back. It comes out onto the, where is going to be the second deck, the lower deck. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. So this, this is actually all completed now. Um, this was, I just pulled this one out because it showed all of the different uh, construction techniques. And, and all that rock is sculptor mold, mold uh, made out of uh, the uh, RTV molds. Uh, these are, it's plaster, plaster in woodland scenics. Uh, uh, yeah. rubber rubber molds. Yeah. Yeah, just you really them. you really can't beat that stuff. It's just it's, it's very easy. Yeah, very, yeah, yeah, yeah. Heavy, but <laughs> it is. What you can't see is the the, the huge the four huge legs on this helix because the whole thing with all of this plaster casting, as you say, is very heavy. Yeah. Well, it's actually a feat to put this stuff together the way you have. It's very nice. Thank you. Uh, and then if we move on to um, some more of the the coloring techniques, uh, so this this is as I said to you earlier is is a an unashamed woodland scenics advert there isn't, <laughs> there isn't anything on here that isn't from woodland scenics I do oh, okay. use other things, but not in this picture so it's you've got the the plaster castings that are from that are there rubber molds um you've got uh the uh tints from the different um washes yeah yes yeah. thank you the yeah, wash, yeah. different washes uh you got fine turf uh and fine t fine earth that's yeah. blown on blown on here like um, green and there. That, and this yeah. this stuff is I think it's, it's I think it's realistic tree material. Fine leaf, foliage. fine leaf. That's it. Fine leaf foliage. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I, I've kind of moved on a bit from this now, but but at the time um, it was a, a very quick and very effective way of 
of, of doing this work. Uh, I was I was pleased with it. There's nothing wrong with it at all. I it love works. It, it works. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. It works. Uh, I, I guess um, I've you tried know, to find some cheaper ways of doing it. That's all. You know what? Uh, Woodland Scenics. You know. Uh, you know. You buy these uh, big. I buy these big expensive craftsman kits to learn how to build these structures and to create a diorama scene because that's what these craftsman kits are about. Mm. Detail parts. And that's what Woodland Scenics really does. They they give you all the parts that you can make this scene, which is like the picture looks like it's so advanced it's not funny. But with those tools, it really makes it easy to put this together with just off the shelf components. You know, it does. Yeah. It's it's hard to get it wrong. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't take any credit for this. It's just off the shelf products. Hey, if you get it wrong, just paint it over. Yeah. Yeah. And if, to be honest, nobody's going to know if it's wrong anyway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Uh, that, rock, that rock is upside down, though. You know. That. <laughs> yeah, deliberately so, because that way you can use them <laughs> twice. And I, I use them, I use them up and down as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's an interesting point though, because there are a limited number of castings, and you do have to start turning them around, breaking them up. Otherwise, yeah. you can't spot that they're being reused. Yeah, 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 yeah. A cut is easily seen like that, that major cut right above the finely foliage there, you know, yep. that would be easily seen even upside down. So yep. you have to get creative with that stuff. Right. You do. Um, in this scene, th there are more materials that I've sourced myself um, and, st and Wilden Scenic stuff as well. All of the trees uh, are just, well, the armatures are th from things that I've got in our garden. Yeah. Um, then again, covered with woodland scenics, uh, coarse, coarse and fine forms, ground forms. Um, a little bit of rattle can spray, browns and greens, just to change the tints. Uh, it's all quite easy. And then around the back there, we've where we've got the brown areas left to the center. That's tea leaves. Oh wow! Okay, perfect. Which, which do good, um, like leaf fall. Yeah, that's These wonderful, ones are pretty... actually, isn't it? It it works well. Uh, these are brown ones, and, and we've moved on to, to green tea now, which actually looks even better. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm on it. I'm on that right now. So, so what do you do to your stems or the, the, tree, tr the tree trunks to preserve them? Is it just the, the rattle can and the glue that uh, does it, or do you do something special? Uh, not far off that. They, they all get dipped in diluted white glue. Mm -hmm. uh, for for five ten minutes. Um, okay, so they're we, penetrated. We hang them up on a on a on a clothesline with with pegs, um, so they can dry. But that's it. Um, mm -hmm. And then they just get uh, use hairspray mm -hmm. to, to stick on the foliage, mm -hmm. uh, and then the rattle can afterwards just to tone down. Sometimes some of the greens are a bit bright. Perfect. So think outside the box and use everyday materials. Awesome. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And and that means I can have hundreds and hundreds of trees and they cost me almost nothing they look there's not a single tree there that i could see other than on the the printed paper it looks fake you know good. It, it's good. beautiful good uh <laughs> a, a lot of a lot of it's um i think is is down to spending time on placement uh it, it may sound a little bit crazy, but every tree goes in with a bit of thought. You know, you put a tree in, you look at it, is it in the right place? You might move it. And and it's a very slow process, but it, there's a right place for every tree, kind of. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, yeah. And then in the last photograph, you showed us that uh, really dark part of shadow. There's a lot of real dark shadows in this picture that, you know. Yeah. This this left hand side. Um, what I do with the scenery is to, is to curve it over the back, so you you do not. There's no edge between. Uh, you don't see the edge where it joins the back scene. Oh, so you see a crest on the hill. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a crest, so it goes over the hill. So the trees in the back actually are planted behind the crest, so you don't see the edge. Oh, and then wow. also you, you get that you can get that black effect by just building up the density of the trees. Oh, I didn't even notice that, but you're right. 
Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Can I zoom in and... Oh, I'm just thinking about it. That's such a great idea. Like, because that is the, the, that horizon line and you've yeah. just made it and those trees are on the other side of the hill. Yeah. Rock and roll. <laughs> it's not a, um, I can't claim to have invented it. It's, hey, you, you know you what? Pick ideas. You pick up ideas from lots of people. You know what? Every idea that you've ever had, you've improved upon it. So what do you do? The, you know what? The first thing that I ever did, uh, on the internet after getting in the hobby was taking some sawdust and making ground foam out of it. And I got in crap for it, for not uh, saying the guy who created the invention, you know, it was like, <laughs> I don't even know who he is. <laughs> Pray tell. There's, there's yeah. nothing new under the sun. Um, no, even and, if you read about somebody else's idea, try yeah, to improve yeah. upon it and don't own it. Just say, this is what I did. Share it. Don't own it. Absolutely. <laughs> Maybe try try and improve upon it. Mix mix techniques together, uh, and you end up with something that that's unique to you. But mm -hmm. it's just a collection of lots of other ideas. Yeah, share this stuff. I don't know. Okay. Static um, grass. Static grass. I can see some in the front here, but you don't use a lot of it, do you? Uh, let me just move on to a static grass picture because. Um, uh, we got some static grass. Uh, now, did, oh, you made your own. Uh, did you use a, a reverse ion generator for yours? I, I didn't make my own, but I, it wasn't far from it. I bought a really, really cheap um, grass gun. And it, it looks to me, you know how you can, I've, I've seen articles on converting uh, these, these fly swatters. Oh, okay. And it looks to me like this is a commercial attempt at converting a fly swatter. So it's, it's okay. It's like <laughs> a it was very, very cheap. Pre-hacked device. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Great. It works. That's it awesome. Works. Okay. That's all yep. you want. Uh, and you can see this, there's a lot of static grass here. Uh, it's perhaps a little slower than using um, one of these $150 uh, this, this AC jobs. Says so much works. to me. This picture says so much to me. You see how the the uh, hopper is staged to the side here. The train's coming in. The hopper looks so substantial as compared to the size of the engine coming in in the back. But they're all yeah. so in focus. And then even the sawmill off to the side. Yep, yeah, this is um, this is focus stacking working hard. <laughs> so this some is people a don't, wonderful some people... photo. Funnily enough, some people don't like this too much. They they they, th they think, and I, I see the point that it's a little unnatural, uh, but it's dramatic. So, but that's that's not your thing, though. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you just that, leave that statement with the, how it left. <laughs> <laughs> there's a there's a place for for both techniques. Sometimes you you want to soften the background of the foreground so you can focus on something in the middle of the picture. Other times you want to just see everything, yeah. and you use, the, you use the technique that fits. Well, if we were talking about the engine in this picture, we could we could use the foreground uh, with the fade or the you know out of focus or bokeh effect or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, yeah. But uh, this is awesome. It almost looks like that uh, engine was like cut in from a real photo. It's, you must use natural lighting. Do you have good lighting? Um, I'm using layout lighting. Uh, it's, um, with that balance, it's, really... it's, I think I'm a little bit lucky. Um, well, no, it's, it's not look, I use, uh, the, the layout lighting is, is daylight, uh, daylight color temperature, um, fluorescence. Uh, this is obviously one of the great benefits of putting that balance in first. Yeah. It, it it tightens the light in quite well, and I also must admit to using Photoshop to do to do some color corrections if things aren't quite right. But it it, it looks pretty good in the in the railroad room. It's not far off this, not far off. It doesn't really show in the background here, but I spend a lot of time trying to get the a, a natural mm. faded blue in the sky. Mm. Um, it's a little bit more blue when you're actually here, mm -hmm. but it works well in photographs because it kind of disappears. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, a lot of sky can look unnatural because mm -hmm. um, there are too many clouds, mm -hmm. uh, and I just kind of make it go away. 
all it takes is one little thing to make your mind say it's not uh, real. Yeah. And when I look at this photo, it's like, holy smokes. <laughs> it worked well. It did work well. So um, static was, grass. Yep. And it, so it's just a cheap device, and it looks like it works flawlessly. Just takes a bit of extra time. Um, but, yep, yeah, it, it works very well. Extra uh, time. Do, do you do it in layers? Uh, uh, sometimes I, I always do it in sections, small sections at a time, just so I don't get bored. Um, and often I'll, I'll go back and do a second layer if I want extra long grass. But in most cases, um, one, one application works. Okay. Uh, and and you, it, you use notch? Yes. Yes. Um, I use about four different, uh, colors, mix them all together. Um, so you get a slightly more natural effect. Mm -hmm. And again, I, I use rattle can. You, it, it, you can possibly see here where I'm circling with a cursor. That it's a browner area. Yeah. And I've just misted that with some rattle can brown. Uh, oh, just okay. add a little bit of light and shade. Cool. So you use a card to kind of like block the track and use your rattle can to miss some. I, I use my hand. <laughs> just put my hand on and mist over. You're like me. Yeah. You, you like to add glue with your finger too, right? <laughs> yeah. There's nothing that you can't fix. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm, I must admit, I'm, I'm very imprecise. Uh, it's, you, know, you, you can spend a lot of time on techniques, but you can do it really quick if you want to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's... All the details, how did you get your, did you buy your details for the sawmill or was that a kit? Oh, the sawmill, uh, the, well, it's a bit of both. Uh, we'll just find the sawmill. Um, let's see now, let's go back to this. I'm, a, I'm, the about, to, yeah, the sawmill. I'm uh, about to build a sawmill myself for the, my Sierra West kit. Yep. Oh, look at this, this is beautiful. It's 95% scratch built. Um, what happened was uh, there was there was a guy um, who did a scratch built sawmill, uh, I think on model railroad hobbyist. It was it was kind of like this bit like this center section, sure. and, and I I used that as a bit of inspiration for the basic shape, mm -hmm. uh, and then just carried on and extended it, uh, and I used um, <laughs> Woodland Scenics uh, rural sawmill kit for part of it. So in the center there, you can just see the saw blade. Yeah. The saw blade and the upright um, steam engine mm -hmm. and some of the gear at the back here, they're, they're woodland scenics, but everything else is scratch built. Uh, it was my, this is my first attempt at nearly 100% scratch building something. Wow. Very and good. And it's, it's turned out quite well. Yeah. So the, um, move on a bit, the, the boiler uh, was scratch built. Uh, so that's just pieces of wood and plastic card uh, and paper, bits of metal. Uh, just wait. So you uh, laminated a piece of dowel with a piece of paper that had the rivets poked yep. through them. Yep, yep. Just um, it's it's three wrappers: one for the smoke box, one for the boiler, and one for the firebox. And I just, as you say, put the rivets in. Um, uh, with with just a, a sharp, I said my old school compass actually, uh, and then just put them onto a piece of dowel, and there was a bit of wood formed the firebox, and that that's pretty much it. And then all those piping, you just uh, drilled right into the dowel and shoved it right in there, and yep. wow, very just nice brass wire. Brass, brass wire. Uh, so it cost nothing, other than a bit of time, uh, and it ended up looking reasonably good. You look clever doing it too. So <laughs> this is it was, awesome. It was an experiment, uh, which I was very pleased with. It, it, it worked quite well. Uh, How did you do the firebox uh, uh, door? Uh, how did I do the firebox door? It's just um, two pieces of, uh, of styrene Paper. sheet. No, oh, styrene, yeah. Two pieces of styrene. Yeah. Um, both kind of oval, well, sort of square shapes just rounded off. And then again, a couple of a couple of rivet pops there, small piece of wire. That's all it is. Yeah, but you just have to wrap and... your head out or wrap your head around it, and you really make anything out of this stuff. Yep, 
and the paint and weathering uh, hides a lot of sins. Yeah. Uh, this didn't look so good when it was plastic and um, and paper. <laughs> Paint's amazing. <laughs> no, I'm amazed by it. I'm, I, you know, I think people learn just by looking at this. Yeah. This is awesome. And looking from the other end, this, this was a derrick that I built. Uh, the upright boiler here was another component from that original Woodland Scenics kit. But yeah. the rest of it was scratch built, just using things from the scrap box, really. Bits of... Bits of uh, bits of plastic, bits of cardboard, bits of wood, um, one or two pieces from other kits. And it just takes time. Yeah. You just find that one piece and you stick it in your pocket. Oh, I could use this for something. Because, you know, you were saying <laughs> earlier that you, you were saying earlier you, you buy some craftsman kits to, to and put them together to see how they, how they go. Yeah. And in a way, that's how I, I ended up scratch building because – I've looked at some craftsman, craftsman kits, particularly older ones that I've got from 1960s on eBay. Yeah. All you get is a box full of sticks and a piece of paper with a vague clue. Yeah. Uh, and after I built a few of those, I thought, well, I'm almost scratch building anyway. Mm, yeah. And the, you're talking Campbell's kits. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and, the, and they're really uh, all about having those types of rivets. And, and it's, it's like loose detail that represents, but is a, totally effective mm. Mm. you know like uh those rivets uh you know they fill in the blanks for your mind it's a small thing but you, yeah. you're absolutely right um it just it it adds some some convincingness <laughs> and it's a it, tiny little thing yeah it doesn't take much at all really yeah. huh awesome very yeah. good very good campbell's kits are still going by the way yes i believe the company was bought by somebody else who kept the name yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I heard. I think the 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 guy knew the former owner and is keeping it going as you know, like, well, he's going to make good money doing it because they're pretty much the pillar of craftsman kits. Like, even though they're kind of cheap and low quality, they're really the pioneer a, of craftsman kits. Absolutely, been around for a long time. A long time. I'm uh, very pleased with them. Mm -hmm. But I'll probably do more scratch building now. <laughs> yeah. I've lost the fear. <laughs> <laughs> no, I believe you. So what kind of stains do you use for your wood? This is pretty much all um, India ink and alcohol mm -hmm. mix. Uh, and then most of the weathering is done with weathering powders. Don't ask me which manufacturer. It's, it's some obscure UK make, but it's weathering powder. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Just applied... Uh, on, you can see here the, the that's Campbell corrugated roofing, mm -hmm. and then that's just done with um, rust, uh, like a red oxide weathering mm -hmm. powder, mm -hmm. and various other colors on the roof. Weathering powders are great. A bit like the rivet thing. You, you can you, you stick some weathering powders on something, and suddenly it looks real. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Like that streak underneath the big pipe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's yeah. like the telltale signs of water damage and stuff absolutely yeah. absolutely so you got this down in a seam now don't you yes um or is this this is the one that we seen in that picture yeah it was it was um it was in the background uh of uh, that picture that that's it over in the background huh. um do, do you want to see another picture of it it's I not wanna, in i want to i want to see it all Okay, it's everything's not, it, done so nicely. Like the hopper in front of that coal tower is like weathered so nicely. Like, how how many times did you fail before you started to really get this stuff the way you wanted it, or did it all just work? Uh, I I don't think I had anything I would call a failure, but I I started with really simple things. Uh, simple structures, simple small things. Um, Baby steps. Baby steps, yeah, like t taking craftsman kits and making a few changes. Mm -hmm. So uh, nothing ever failed. I just kind of got more confident and, and a little better at it. Mm -hmm. um, it, you, it just you, takes... you found out where to go more. Yep, yep. Yeah. Uh, that's a picture with it. That's it in the background there. Um, Beautiful. Huh. I think we're coming back. To, this isn't. This scene isn't finished in this picture. I think we're gonna we're gonna yeah, discuss that a little yeah. later. Yeah. 
Uh, is there another view? There probably is another view. Uh... Oh, here we go. This is um, this is an addition uh, that was made to that original kit. This is this is the kit. Sorry, the original structure. Uh -huh. This is uh, a, a green chain uh, unit for moving finished timber across and then into the yard. Stacking. Uh, that's, Stacking. That's all, yeah, and it's all again. That's all just scratch build. Yeah. That took me about fifteen minutes. Yeah. To, not not obviously longer to, to to weather it and paint it, but to actually construct it took no, no time at all because you're just using scrap materials, bits of wood. Yeah, but when you're scratch building, uh, the time it takes to do the scene is not the building of that. It you probably pondered this thing for a while. Yeah. 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 That's I did. the way yeah. I build models. People complain about me not finishing them. It's like I haven't even thought about how to do it. So. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. It's the it's the thinking time that counts, um, yeah. and and it pays off because when you actually come to do it, uh, it, it 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 happens a little bit more smoothly. Yeah, yeah, purposeful. Yeah, yeah. Don't want that. Okay, where should we go next? Uh, let's look at those cottages. Okay. Yeah, because I, I I love the 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 clothing uh, hanging on the line. Uh, well, let, let's. Let's have a look. We'll move move to take, that picture. Yeah, take um, us on the tour, Monsieur. Take a little tour, because um, I know I know you commented on the this this uh, bank um, when you first saw the the, the picture. I'm a um, modeler, buddy. I can talk about this stuff all day <laughs> all day long. <laughs> so this is like an an earlier version of the scene where I was trying out houses, trying to get the levels. I had actually decided the levels, hadn't really decided the backdrop, but this is pure sculptor mold here um mm -hmm. behind is some uh carved foam and that, okay. that that's just covered in with filled in with, with sculptor mold and it's it's just natural sculptor mold applied roughly yeah uh, quite so dry. it and just you, 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 does a contour or, or joins yeah. them together in a yeah. hill like way yeah. yeah and you get this nice um textured effect on the front and so there's the printed paper in the back. You just put that there just to feel for, get a feel for it, or yes. or yeah. are, it's, is it absolutely sure going in? It's not the finished backdrop. It it was just really to get a feel. I was trying out ideas as as to how yeah. the backdrop should look. Painting the picture in your mind. Yeah. yeah. You know, we were, we were saying earlier when you were asking me about how did I set up a scene, I just move things around, uh -huh. try ideas, try different pictures. Um, uh -huh. an, er an earlier iteration of this whole scene was more of a town scene with a street behind, um, but but I've been that, um, and we ended up with this. Uh -huh. So, sculpt the mold, um, and then we, uh, we apply here a little bit of um, stain. Uh, it's just a woodland scenics dark earth tint. Actually, can awesome. you go back one picture? Sorry. Yeah. That's tea leaves all be between those uh, rails, eh? Uh, not on this picture. No, this is um, this is just ballast, mixed grey and and brown granite ballast. Uh, oh, okay. Okay. Having said that, <laughs> in a later picture. It's all filled in. This is this is all tea leaves in here, but I, I haven't used them here. This is actually ballast. Oh, okay, so in the next picture is the tea leaves. Yeah, these are tea okay. leaves here. Oh, yep. tea leaves. Yeah, and here. Very cheap. Very easy. Yeah. Just oh, it's uh, the right color. Yeah, a white. Yeah, it, it's a good, a great base color um, because if when you put grass on afterwards or other things, and this shows through, it looks good. Doesn't need any extra treatment. And it's yeah. free. It's yeah, free. wow. It's not that it's free. It's 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 a texture that sits down as opposed to, you know, a rock that'll sit way up high on the on the ground. You know, it yeah. really sits down nice. I'm gonna use this stuff. Yeah, it's good. I'm uh, on it. And you can see here this is this is the a finished backdrop. Uh what I eventually oh, decided. The trees to are use. much much different now, yeah. yeah. Um, they're, they're more in line with, with some of the backdrop trees that I use for the rest of the railroad. I, I decided that I should try and keep a similar style of tree mm -hmm. uh, because it, 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 it jars a bit sometimes if you try something too different. Are these Joey Ricards or do you print your own? Print my own. Um, oh. I found these with my friend Google, Google <laughs> Images. Uh, yeah. There's a, there's a, 
a ton of stuff out there. It's amazing it, what you do, what you get when you put trees in Google search. Absolutely. <laughs> so I just found a, a good high res image. Good high res image, and then using Photoshop, you can you can I think you can probably tell here that this this is the right hand side is a reversal of the left oh. with a little bit of scaling. Ooh. So um, it's quite easy to to move the trees around uh, to get different pictures. Yeah. Uh, Cut and paste. And, Cut and, and paste. And I'm lucky enough to have an A3 printer uh, on the color on the inkjet, so oh, I can wow. print fairly large sections and join them together. And then you, you can put trees up the joints. Uh huh. So it's very flexible. Uh, yeah. I wouldn't say it was cheap. Ink, inkjet isn't cheap, but it, it's uh, it's flexible. Well, you can have well as compared to buying. Well, actually, this is totally custom, so you really can't buy this. No, you can't. Um, but it has that advantage that it's exactly what you want. Yeah. Yeah. And when you thought about a scene and, you know, uh, yeah, you've really sculpted this and you really can't buy this. Wow. You can't. You can't. And I see the road in behind that, that first cottage there. Is that another 45 that goes up onto the... Or yeah, is that for real? <laughs> it's, no, it's that's a back. It's backdrop up up until this point of join here. Yeah, that's pure backdrop. Um, and then you've got a triangle there that goes into the backdrop. Uh, or, well, actually, this piece isn't finished yet. Um, in some later uh, photographs, if, if we get to see them, there is actually a road runs across here. This yeah. ha hasn't been done yet. So oh, there okay. is a much like we saw in the the earlier photograph when we were talking about focus stacking. Um, and th there's a road here with a little hump to hide the join, but oh, it just has, hasn't been done yet in this picture. Yeah. Well, the one thing I'd like to point out right here is the only bright colors that I see, other than the white on the houses, is the green on the trees. All the colors on the houses are really muted and toned down. Yeah. And that's that's really makes for a really realistic house. And that's really what made me say uh when we first met that uh your work really r reminded me of my first guest Evandro yeah. because his models really have this color like he captures the color and the really only bright colors in the scene is nature absolutely um you, you've you've hit on something that's quite important to me which is to not use too many colors uh, and try and keep it all a bit muted. I think mm -hmm. George Selyus does an amount of that as well. There's, there's a kind mm -hmm. of a darkness to what he does. Mm -hmm. um, and it works for me. Uh, not everybody likes it, but I, I try and use very few colors. As you say, there's grays and greens. The odd bit of red, just mm -hmm. to add a bit of relief. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, even the green here on the trees disappears a little when you start putting the foreground trees in place. Mm -hmm. But the whole oh, thing is, is very calm. Yeah, I like it. Sizing up. Uh, so, next stage. Yes. Um, here we've um, obviously we've we've got background trees in which are filling in the gap. Mm. We've got some of that black effect we were talking about before, where you think it's going deeper than it is. Dead space. Yes. Dead space. Absolutely. Um, and then this front section. Uh, all I've done is to uh, to blow. I think I think the term's called fly specking. It's something my some Miles Hale do. So you get a folded bit of paper, put your um, your fine fine turf earth uh, ground form in there, and blow it gently onto the, the vertical surfaces, uh -huh. and it, it ends up with this quite nice dry earth effect. Huh. Like real mossy rock kind of look. Yeah. Or yeah. And a little bit of static grass. And then um, that also adds your your nice dark shadows in there you, you you've kept those in there yeah oh wow what did you use for your uh path there because it's real dark um it was uh a very dark ballast I might have been called cinders something like yeah, that probably but it's, yeah. it's just a dark ballast that's been put in with 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 white glue uh just sure. to get that uh, to give you the feeling that people walk along here and it's all got squashed down and i put darker areas outside the doorsteps again representing where people will be 
be walking a lot and wearing out the wearing out the ground. These are company houses. These are workmen, and there yeah. are work people. There were yeah. workmen back then, but work people, yeah. and you know they had dirt on their boots, and they had a dirty path back home, man. Yeah. Yep. It fits the uh, scene perfect. And w one of the things that um, that I didn't think of, but when I was uh, putting this out in a forum to get ideas. Uh, I, I showed a photograph. Let me just see if it. See this photograph here? This this was the photograph that kind of inspired the scene to an extent. Uh, and I hadn't looked at this really closely, but another guy did. And he said, notice on top of the, the porch on the left there, all of the stones that the kids have thrown up. And I thought, yeah, that's a really nice feature. So um, we've got stones on the roof. <laughs> all the kids have thrown them up. It's just, it's just a little feature that, you know, it kind of, kind of brings some life to the picture. Yeah. 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 That be that is a good idea. Yeah. There's nothing like real life for um, guiding you down the right path. Yeah. There's nothing like getting a couple of kids with stones in that scene to show <laughs> <laughs> people don't figure it out. That's Actually later idea. on, we, we, uh, it's, no, it's not in this scene. Since you mentioned the kids, we do actually have them. Uh, quickly go there. Where are those kids? Where are the kids? They are around here. Oh, well, there's one kid. He's watching the chickens. Um, <laughs> where is it? Yeah, there they are. Those are the kids responsible for the storms. Yeah, and the dog. <laughs> <laughs> No doubt. Yeah. No doubt. Beautiful scenes. It, you know, it's really nice to see how, like, a scene can come together with colors and what colors you can use for a scene because I think people really, you know, use only what they have in the drawer as opposed to what they want to use. And, you know, it's good to see photos like yours because then people can kind of copy you or, you know, learn from you. You know, I'll take I mean? some ideas. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. I like Okay. This. What's the next scene, Monsieur? Uh, let's see. I think, um, oh, yeah. We were going to talk about um, how a scene gets composed, I think. Yeah. I think uh, we've been talking about that for a while now, but let's keep it going. <laughs> uh, so, because I know a while back you said, um, "How do I how do I imagine a scene? Yeah, uh, how do I how do I build it? Perfect. Um, the the thing is to like break it down into manageable sections. Yeah. So this this is um, one wall of the room. Um, I kind of treat each wall as a scene in its own right. So uh -huh. two decks, four walls per deck. There's eight major scenes on the railroad, um, and then in each corner. You've got a, a transition from one scene to the next. Yeah. So when I came into to this scene, this left-hand transition corner was kind of done. It's a view block yeah. to bring it here. Uh, and I, I decided I was going to put some kind of mining scene here. But that was about as far as, as I'd gone. We just have the main going through and the, the spur for the mine. Uh, and then it was a case of just putting things in there. Um, that This is moving on a little where, um, again, I, I took some advice from um, guys off a forum mm -hmm. who suggested I should try and model as much of the mine as possible. I was initially going to just do one building, but they said, why not do the mine stamp mill and an ore bin? And I thought, well, I've got the space. So once you've decided that you need these two buildings, then the, the scene starts building itself because the stamp mill has to sit above the ore bin because that's how the material flow goes out of the mine, into the stamp mill, then across to the ore bin. So there's, once you put that in, then the back scene kind of flows down from that. Uh, and then I decided I'd have a creek over here. So you can see how I'm just building it up by putting blocks in, moving mm -hmm. the buildings around to see where, just where things fit correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, this is on the right-hand side of the scene where I decided to put in a creek, like an mm -hmm. S-band creek, and a little mirror that we'll come back to later. That, that, wasn't an original idea. Uh, so it, it, it just slowly grows. Well, yeah. Those mirrors are never an original idea, but do they ever work once you figure out how to use them? 
Like uh, I've seen yeah. a few people use them really well. You and I know Joe Fugate has done a really good job with the mirror on one of his roads too. Like uh, it's just amazing how it works so well. Uh, well. I think I may have a shot, another shot later on of it completed, but the hard part with the mirror is making sure that you don't get reflections of, uh, of operators in the aisle. From so, certain angles, yeah. You really have to cut the angles to the views that work. Indeed. And what yeah. I did here was to um, cut the mirror, mirror off low and sit it right down. It's not too obvious here, but it's sitting low down in the scene. And and you're looking at the S-curve, I can see exactly. right there. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the S-curve and the scenery, the scenery work that ends up going in, in this corner of the S reflects in the mirror and sits high enough up that when somebody's walking around in the aisle, you don't see them. Yeah. And it looks there's like nothing it's kills it. on back there. Yeah. There's nothing kills the realism of a mirror more quickly than seeing somebody's hand in it. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. <laughs> yeah. This is, that's a really good idea here. Just to put it down right at the beginning and ponder it. Yeah. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, this is starting to build. But we've advanced here, obviously. This is into the construction of the rock and what have you. Mm -hmm. uh, that's about as much as to say here. We've, we've looked at these techniques before, but it's just fleshing it out with something mm -hmm. real. There's the mine entrance in the, in the hill. Mm -hmm. uh, this is going back to the... Um, the creek scene. It's a Campbell Bridge. Yeah. Uh, more of the aluminum mesh um, and the plaster cloth. Uh, it's it's worth mentioning. I lay all of my track on this uh, this foam. It's actually foam that you use for um, putting underneath laminated flooring. Uh, it's really cheap, and I put it everywhere. I put it on all the the um, the yard areas and on the track, so you get good sound deadening properties and you can cut it away really easily um, to have like slight ups and downs in the ground. So huh. it's, 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 and it's cheap. Yeah. Uh, again, I'll check that out. I'm sure we got different stuff than what you got there. I think it's a really yeah. open cell stuff, what we have, but yeah, I think it's different. This, this is quite close cell. Um, oh, okay. So that's kind of like a foam board, kind of like a gator foam where it's got the paper it, on each side of it. It's it's not that hard. It, it's it's quite soft, but it is a very close texture. Oh, okay, I see. Okay, cool. Uh, and then you, we can see I'm I'm just trying out some trees. Just to, yeah. it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to look like that, but I think you have to put things down because to, to visualize them. I, I'm I'm not very good at at, at seeing a scene in my yeah. head. Yeah, you're I trying to, to figure out how to terminate the mirror in a very fade, like with with a fade, like so you can't see an edge. Yeah. I, I, end, I ended up, we'll probably see later, I, I ended up putting a kind of a um, an archway of trees across there, yeah. which kind of worked, kind of yeah. worked. Um, moving on again, um, this is uh, the whole scene covered with um, polyfiber. Oh, okay. Raw polyfiber glued on. Uh, again, the, the, the back scene's developing there, that's what we th we're going to have in the background. Yeah, and, and that's a nice way to get texture all along that field without getting rock look to it. Yeah. Yeah, that's what like I wanted, a bit of contrast. Yeah. yeah. And and there it is with um, blown on uh, ground foam just oh, cool. on top of that polyfiber. Okay. And it's it looks pretty good. Yeah, just the tree tops. Very Well, it's it's actually oh. not tree tops. It's, um, it's kind of very dense shrub effect yeah yeah the, okay the trees like, the trees go on top of this and you, you, a lot of it disappears but it forms a very dense uh ground, real looking ground ground cover yeah yeah it's ground cover yeah cool yeah uh and there we further develop the scene yeah you can still see the mirrors slightly in the top at that last picture but it just disappeared before my eyes <laughs> it's it's starting to go starting to go with the um the trees. Uh, yeah, it's busy oh, no. to the point where it's gone for me. Yeah. And then, uh, oh, actually, can, maybe I can find, let me just see if I can find a, a, a final picture of that. Uh, <laughs> have we got time for this? Sure. Let's yeah, go for you, it. You can edit out the um, the boring bits where I'm looking for pictures. Uh, I have a feeling there are no boring bits in this one. <laughs> where will it be? Where will it be? It'll be in Vesma. Uh, yeah, 
that's almost finished. Um, actually, no, I know where we go. There it is, finish scene. Oh, wow. So that's everything applied. Um, the I'm depth in the water where your eye, your your cursor just was. Look at, yep. look at the darkness in the middle there. Uh, that here. Yeah, like no, just all the way down past the rocks to the bottom of the photo. There's a darkness in the water there. It's just there's a lot of depth to it. You really do take shadow to its uh, most useful task. For it's, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to find words here because I'm just in awe of the photo. Oops. Like um, even in the back, I can see lots of shadow in the water. Uh, I, again, I, I can't claim to have invented this one. I, I just followed guidance from from lots of people in the in the modeling community and and painted the the base with lighter colors towards the edges and darker colors towards the center, uh, and then put on uh, quite a few layers of en Envirotex, like epoxy, uh, and and it ended up looking like that. Um, and a little bit of um, Mod Podge on the top yeah, to, for to get the, 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 the water effect. Yeah. yeah. And it, it, it worked out really well. Um, in fact, I, I keep accidentally going back to this picture, but that's the mirror again. You can see it in this photograph. Yeah, because the I've water gets in. really clear. But other than that, it's... At a glance, you, you wouldn't tell. Uh, and that pipe work there, that's a half pipe, and it reflect the pipe reflects in the mirror. And obviously, all of these stones are just reflections of stones this yeah, side. Yeah. But that yeah. was one of the uh, the advantage of doing this S curve was that I could use everything that was sitting in here that you don't see from the aisle to form the reflection in the mirror. Oh yeah. So f from that point where I'm moving my cursor backwards is is pure hey. reflection. <laughs> yeah. It's almost like magic. Yeah, it I, is I, magic. It is I was magic. So surprised. Yeah. You, you want you let one kid see how you you uh, do that sleight of hand and the magic's all over. And, <laughs> and it's it is magic. Yeah. yeah. It only takes one little mistake and the magic trick's gone. Yeah. It, to, to be fair, if if you're in the in the train room um, and you look at it more than once, you're going to see it. Yeah, well, this is this brings us back to the photographs and why you want to have uh, ultimate uh, focus from the front to the back so you can zoom into these photos where the suspect is and, you know, yeah. get rid of well, it. Alternatively, make sure that the suspect bit is out of focus <laughs> uh, <Yeah. laughs> and people don't see it. Exactly, exactly. Uh, you see how all of the, the trees have covered most of that... Um, Ground, ground foam, ground foam, and polyfiber. It almost all disappears, but it's quite important to get it in there because it does show through, and you notice if it's not there, mm -hmm. helps mm -hmm. with the depth. You know, we, we, again, we talked about this. The depth in there, it isn't there. It's just creating darkness through texture in the trees. Mm -hmm. It's all about faking things. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it texture and different lines, like you can see the trunks on your trees, which is fairly rare, you know, for the most part. People people don't really make their own trees for the most part, so they they probably don't, but um it was it was the path of least resistance for me because as I say, we've got a garden full of these things. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, it's perfect. Why not? Why not? I, I imagine a lot of people don't have these natural materials to hand. It depends on where you live in the world and what you've got naturally occurring. Uh, I imagine most unlucky. people don't think outside the box. Yeah. And as I keep saying, it saves money. <laughs> yeah. Look at this. You, you could plow through scenery with stuff like this. You know, you, you've spent a little bit of money on the notch yes. grasses, uh, ground covers, which you can buy in fairly large bins. Yeah. But the, the good thing about the woodland scenic stuff is that, okay, it's a little, and, 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 the, and, the, and the knock stuff, but it's quite, it's quite pricey, but it goes a long way. Yeah. Well, you only need it for a little bit. You don't, you don't use ground cover for the entire grass. <laughs> you got to put other stuff on. I think a lot depends on the size of the railroad as well. I, mean, I, I don't know how big your railroad is. Uh, is yours a large thing? Mine is... Uh, I'm making about four modules at the moment. One's an eight foot long module and is a yard. Yep. And I've got a engine terminal 
that has uh, is fully scenic, and that's six feet long. And then I've got a four foot long waterfront diorama. So they're bi- they're all modules, and they're going to be for a yeah. railroad one day. But yeah. but the, the interesting thing is that there's none of those are too big. Um, and one of the things that that's been great for me is that I, I've tried to keep the size of the railroad down, partially mm-hmm. through what's the available space, but a, a huge railroad great to have but i think it's going to take you forever to build yeah and you can whether smaller railroad or modules you can really concentrate on smaller things like this scene Mm -hmm. Uh, go to town on it really enjoy it yeah there's a lot of time joining those scenes together uh after the fact but you know to start with a basic uh vignettes of what you want to present in your railroad and join those together that's kind of the process for me too and yeah. So, we've kind of got through everything that we had in our rough agenda. Uh, is is there anywhere else you'd you'd like to go? Or are we um are we done? You know what? I think we should end this today. Yeah, let's end it. Let's end it. Uh, sure. It's been a great talk, Rob. And uh, please keep on posting on the Modelers Guild because you've really, I think you've really upped our game. Well, thank you very much. I think the Modelers Guild is, is a great place. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of people out there, um, and I enjoy, I enjoy looking at what other people have done as much as posting my own stuff. And like you, I've enjoyed the session um, to the future. Awesome. Awesome. Nice talking to you, Rob. Bye-bye. You too. Have a good day.